here is described Jehinam Avyayam. The living entity within the body, he is eternal. Avyayam means um, that which does not diminish, that which does, diminish, does not diminish or does not change. A person very much in the mode of goodness may change and become in the mode of passion or ignorance. Or a person in the mode of ignorance may eventually come to the mode of goodness. But Krishna is pointing out that all these conditions of the modes of material nature bind the eternal living being to the material world. And therefore, uh, Krishna is advising to become free from the effects of the modes of material nature and come to the eternal position beyond the modes of material nature. In that condition, one does not change. That doesn't mean that he doesn't have any personality. And in personality, there are different moves also. But the transcendental moves of a liberated devotee are all based on service to Krishna, whereas a conditioned soul is only thinking how to satisfy his own senses. And thus a conditioned soul is ruled by the three modes of material nature, whereas a pure devotee, sometimes he may be in a gentle mood, sometimes in an angry mood, but his motive is only to please Krishna. For instance, we saw Srila Prabhupada, who is undoubtedly a great pure devotee of Krishna. Sometimes he was expressing great pleasure in his devotee's efforts to serve Krishna. And sometimes he was very angry at the arguments of the impersonalists and the atheists. But he was always fixed in transcendental service to Krishna. So there is a great difference between the moods of a pure devotee and the moods of a conditioned soul. Sometimes uh, people who don't know actually how a sadhu should behave think that a sadhu should simply be aloof from everything. So definitely a sadhu is aloof in the sense that he's not interested in personal sense gratification. But a preacher of Krishna Rajas is very much involved in the world because he has service to perform to Krishna in this world. He has to preach the message of Krishna in this world, therefore he has to be involved in it. For instance, uh, any money that comes in his hand, he's concerned to use it properly for Krishna. He doesn't think, oh, this money, this is material, I don't want it. He thinks that this can be used in Krishna's service. If I can use this to print books for Krishna, or purchase both and offer prasad, offered up to Krishna and distribute prasad, that will benefit people. So he's, he's pleased to get money, because he thinks, oh, now I can, now I can serve Krishna more like this. Of course, Krishna says in Gita, Patram Pushpam Parantayam, you can offer me meat, food, flour, fruit, or water, I will be satisfied. But to preach the message of Krishna in the modern world is a great undertaking. If the sadhus simply sit in the forest and offer flowers to Krishna, that is very nice for their own spiritual advancement. But that will not help others to understand Krishna. So a sadhu comes into this world and acts within this world for the benefit of others. That means if we are to preach, we should do so by all means available. We should print books, build temples, and so many different things. So that requires much endeavor, much activity, much organization. It seems everyone can understand English. <laughs> <laughs> and why are you translating? And uh, that requires much funds. Uh, you may be surprised to see uh, devotees using all these different things, but the, the purpose is to satisfy Krishna. So it requires transcendental vision to see how a devotee is living in this world, but not affected by the modes of material nature. He is not a materialist because he's doing everything to satisfy This is the way to be liberated, even while living in this world. We have heard the term Jivan Mukta, one who is liberated even in this life. That is stated in the Narada Pancharatra. Iha Yasya Hariya Dasya, Kamanara, Namasarahira, Nikela Spatya Nastasu, Jivan Mukta Sauchati. Someone who, while living in this world, engages his works, Kamana, his mind, and his words in the service of Hari is known to be liberated in this very life. So although he is moving within the atmosphere of the three modes of material nature, he has conquered over the three modes of material nature by engaging all his words, activities, and thoughts in the service of Krishna. This chapter of Bhagavad Gita is entitled The Three Modes of Material Nature. 
in which Krishna describes the, interact, the, the interactions of the modes of material nature and how it affects the condition, how they affect the conditioned souls. But the real point is not simply to make some psychological analysis. The real point is to teach us how to rise above the modes of material nature. And that is described by Krishna at the end of this chapter, in which Krishna says,
more question about this. Is jnana and bhakti one and the same? Knowledge and wisdom one and the same? Um, yes. What did I say? Uh, knowledge, well, you said jnana and bhakti. Knowledge and wisdom. But you have translated bhakti as wisdom. Possibly much. The thing is that knowledge is theoretical and activity is practical. Yeah, it's just like, it's it's just like someone, yeah. someone may be trained as a doctor, but unless he practices as a doctor, then the knowledge that he's attained is of no practical use. So I'm saying, what does Yan mean? Yan means to know who I am, what is the meaning of life. That is Adhatmic Yan. So Adhatmic Yan means to understand I am not the body, I am Atma, I am eternal, I am the eternal servant of Krishna. So if one actually has got that knowledge, then what will he do? He will serve Krishna, and that is Bhakti. So Bhakti is the realized state of Jnana. Now of course, Adhyatmic Jnana is often propagated as being something impersonal. People are advertised as Jnanis who have an impersonal concept of the Absolute Truth. But real Gyan, or, or full, mature, complete Gyan, means to understand that I am the eternal servant of Krishna. Going to holy places is very important. If you are not going, it is like the root of a tree, static. But if you are not in a position to go to such holy places, what is to be done? If you chant Hare Krishna, then Krishna is present. Why are the holy places holy? What makes the holy places holy? Because of the presence of Krishna, why do people go to Sri Ranga? Because Ranganatha Swami is there. Why do people go to Tiramala? Because Srinivas is there. But if you chant Hare Krishna, Krishna is there. Actually, Shastra says when you go to the holy place, even more important than taking bath and seeing the deity is to associate with sadhus. That means that at the holy places there are meant to be sadhus who will teach you what is the importance of the holy place? Unfortunately, in many holy places, there are no such sadhus present. So, actually, you'll get more benefit from coming here and getting spiritual instruction and going from, to many of the holy places. In many ways, this rented building here is more of a holy place than many famous temples. Because you can visit many famous temples, and no one will give you any instruction that will improve your life. People are going as a kind of ritual. They go, they take darshan, they take ladu, and they come. But they don't get any valuable instruction to improve their spiritual life. But that we will get here. So, in many ways, coming here and associating with the devotees is more important than visiting many holy places. Maharaj, in the Ukrainian religion, uh, there is only a belief that after leaving body, we go to God. Likewise, in our uh, following also here, we think that we are going to Krishna. Uh, Prabhu's wife has been uh, putting raising and question to him. You are going there, but how do you know after your death you will be going to Krishna? Who has confirmed it so far? Well, what would you consider proof? Sasha. No, I am asking a question. What would you consider proof? <laughs> How far away is the sun from the earth planet? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yes, uh, According to scientists, it's about at least, when I was in school, and I had changed them, it's 93 million miles. <laughs> I, don't know how, I don't know how many kilometers that is. It's about 140 million kilometers. So whatever it is, there's an accepted figure. We can say that the sun is about 140 million miles away. Would your wife accept that? Huh? Ah, yeah, she is accepting that. Why? Because they make it to her. Mr. Scientist. Yeah, yeah. Does she know herself? She has read from some books, and so she knows. Ah. Why does she accept? Practical people is there. Practical people is there. Practically they are proved. But how does she know what the proof is? Ah, okay. She doesn't know, but she accepts ah, the scientists. Um, she accepts them as authorities in a field of knowledge in which she has no entry, She's not, she has no understanding of it. So, similarly, in the matter of understanding what happens after death, there are certain authorities who are accepted by all experts in this field. And all the experts in the field of spiritual knowledge all have 
concept that after the demise of the body, the soul continues to exist. Uh, they have their method of understanding, which you may not understand. Just like we don't know how the scientists come to their conclusion about the distance of the sun from the earth. If you accept it under the, the authority of persons who know the science and who are experts and who are authorities in it. Now, there is a uh, common myth that scientists don't accept the existence of life after death. Well, that is true of some scientists, but not all scientists. There are many scientists who believe in God and accept the existence of the soul after death. Here we have two doctors, Keshavana and Das, and Mayush, uh, trained in science, spent many years studying medicine, uh, qualified as doctors, they've done their thing, fully qualified, and they're chanting Hare Krishna because they know that even though they've studied so much about the body, that more important is the, than the body is the soul. Einstein believed in the at least superficial. So you may not accept Krishna as an authority, but if you accept Einstein as an authority, then you should believe in God. What do they say the distance? You just you were in school recently. What's the distance from the sun to the earth? You know what? They don't teach anymore. They're, coming <laughs> They're probably confused. It's not, it's not. General science topic. I mean, I learned that when I was six years old. What about you? You were less recently. What do they say? Nothing. Yeah, that's right. Forty nine sixteen thousand meters. Forty nine. 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 Devotees who are themselves serious to pure devotees. 
So our own personal intention is very important, and our, the association we keep is also very important. <coughs> so I think the association you're getting here is very favorable for advancing in devotional service. Yeah. What? Yeah. It's good fortune. It's good fortune to have such favorable association. And that is that is the meaning of God. God is not omnipresent and He's not God. But He's also a person with specific form. God means purna, complete. So He He is complete in His own transcendental form. At the same time, He's all pervading and omnipresent. So Loka even in the Satyakila of Buddha, Brahma Sandeep describes that He is he resides in the Lord Vrindavan and he's also present within the heart of every living being. No, in material by material understanding we can't understand this. This appears to be a contradiction. But for God, everything is possible. If he's not omnipresent, then he's incomplete. If he doesn't have form, he's incomplete. So everything is possible for God, even though we can't imagine it. Try to understand simply by logic, it may not be possible. <clears throat> logic is useful for understanding up to a certain level, but the nature of God is ultimately achinta. It's beyond the power of our brain to understand. We can understand to a certain extent. That's why Krishna explains about himself in Bhagavad Gita. But some things can be understood simply by accepting them. It's like know. the story of the Brahma and the Kabla. You know that story? Yes. No, the story is that there were Narad Muni was wandering along the path and he came across one cobbler sitting under a banyan tree. The cobbler offered his obeisances and asked Narad Muni, Where are you going? So Narad, Narad said, I'm going to Vaikuntha to see the vision. So the cobbler again offered obeisances and said, Oh, you're so fortunate. You're such a great devotee. Please ask Lord Narayan. When I may get the chance to directly see his lotus feet and come to his abode, so after Narada Muni went on after some distance, he saw one great Brahmana reciting the Vedas. So the Brahmana saw him and said, Narada Muni, where are you going? And said, I'm going to my country to see Lord Vishnu. So the Brahmana said, Well, tell him, you know, I'm, I'm quite old now, so I'll be dying soon, and uh, certainly I'll be liberated. So tell him to. And have a good reception party waiting for me again. So Narad went to see Lord Vishnu, and after praising him in so many ways, he mentioned about the Brahmana and the Kabla. So Narad said, Well, the Brahman is expecting to come soon, he asked me to mention to you. But Lord Narayan said, Oh, he won't be coming to me very soon. He said, I, I don't I, I don't know, maybe many, many millions of lives before he comes to me. And Narad said, Oh, really? What about the Kabla then? And he really, he really has no chance of coming to you. Lord Narayan said, no, he's coming in this next life. Just right. just as when he gives up his body. And I said, well, how is that possible? He's a very pious, learned Brahmana. He's not coming to you after millions of years. But Kabla, he's dealing with leather all the time. He's not at all educated. And you say he's coming to you? How is that possible? So Lord Narayan said, I'm not going to give you the answer directly, but you'll find out. When you meet the Brahmana and the Kabla again, you tell them both that when you saw me, I was engaged in putting an elephant through the eye of a needle. So now it is going to very confused. The Brahmana is not coming to Vishnu, but the Kabla is, and I had to tell them both that Narayan was putting an elephant through the eye of a needle. So yeah. on his way back, he saw the Kabla, he saw the Brahmana first. So the Brahmana said, Oh, oh, Narada, so. Uh, are they getting the reception party ready for me? And now it said, um, well, actually no. Lord Vishnu told me that you won't be coming to him even in many, many millions of births. So the Brahman said, oh, I don't believe you're going to see Lord Vishnu at all. Tell me, what was Lord Vishnu doing when you saw him? So now it said, he's putting an elephant to the eye of the needle. And said, just see, she said, you never went to see Narayan no again. When having you put an elephant through the eye of a needle. So you think I'm just a Brahmin reciting Vedas, but I also studied physics in school. According to the law of laws of physics, an elephant 
and go to the eye of the needle. Get out of here, you cheating. So now it went up and he came to the cobbler sitting under the banyan tree. The cobbler immediately paid his full obeisances to him and said, Oh, Nara Muni, you're so fortunate. It means if I come to and see my Lord Narayan, please tell me what wonderful activity was Lord Narayan doing when you saw him. Now it said he was putting an elephant to the eye of the needle. The cobbler said, Ah, oh, how wonderful. My Lord is so wonderful. So now it said, Well, you know, you're just a cobbler, you didn't go to school. If you studied physics, you'd know that an elephant can't go through the eye of the needle. So how can you believe that Lord Narayan is doing it? The cobbler said, You see, I'm sitting under this huge banyan tree, and in every tiny seed of the banyan tree, there's another huge banyan tree. Lord Narayan put it there. So if he can put a huge tree in a small seed, you can put an elephant through the eye of the needle. He's God, he can do whatever he likes. And if he can't do whatever he likes, then he's not God. So this is a case of understanding by accepting. If you accept that Bhagavan can put an elephant through the eye of the needle, then simply by accepting it, you can understand it. And that is the beginning of understanding God, that he has a chintya shakti. A chintya shakti means he can do that which is not conceivable to us. And unless you accept that God has a chintya shakti, then actually we don't accept God at all. Because if he does things which are conceivable to us, then he's not much greater than us. Uh, very, some of very fast at running. They can, they can run a mile in less than four minutes. Again, we make miles. But you can't imagine that someone would run to Madras in four minutes. But God can do it. He's there and he's here. Simultaneously. Even a yogi can do that. Although science can't explain how. So God is everywhere and he's simultaneously present in his own abode, in his original dragon temple form as Krishna. That is the fact according to Shastra. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.